Shape water is incredible. It's a super fun cantrip that has about a million and one uses and just as many rules questions. For starters, here's a spell's description and the classes who can cast it. Now let's get right into 27 ways to use Shape Water in your next D&D game. As a starting point, Shape Water has four bullet points that all indicate a different use of the spell. For the sake of staying organized, I'll break down the spell's uses by each of its bullet points, starting with the first, which is to move or change the flow of water. This is the only instantaneous effect of the cantrip, all the others last for up to one hour. The most important use of moving water is to move water that you hope to shape and or freeze to a more suitable location or container. Many of the other uses I'll be talking about require this as a first step. Unless the water you're trying to manipulate is already where you want it, you'll need to sloppily move a 935 gallon cube of water from a larger source. On a simpler note, you can move water to throw boiling water at a creature. The Dungeon Master's Guide suggests 1d10 damage for being burned by hot coals, so that seems like a reasonable amount of damage if a creature fails a dexterity save or something. Note that DM Fiat is a thing here, but most will reward creative thinking with a damage value of equal or lesser value to any other damaging cantrip. Another niche use is to move water onto suspected traps. The maximum weight you can move with shaped water is approximately 7,800 pounds. Even a fraction of that should be enough to trigger a pressure plate, even if it does immediately splash onto the floor and disperse. And then there's the fun role-playing use to wash or dry a creature, either by moving water onto them to wash them or by moving it off them to dry them. Next up, let's look at bullet number two of shape water, and that's to shape or animate water. The most important use of this effect is to create shapes to freeze. Once you've moved some volume of water to the space you need it, the next step is to shape it into something functional. The popular choices here include things like ladders, makeshift bridges, walls, improvised weapons, and very basic tools like wedges and doorstops. Remember that you're limited to simple shapes, so you can't make anything mechanical. But even shaping crude constructions for later freezing can be useful. Another good use of this effect is to leave behind messages. If you want to leave behind a one-hour self-deleting message for an ally to find, shape water can be a handy way to do it. It doesn't even have to be a literal words, either. A symbol, number, or arrow might be good enough to convey important information without risking the wrong eyes seeing it. And you can even animate it to dance around in a way that's sure to grab a passerby's attention. Next, I'm turning to bullet number three of the spell, and that's to alter water's appearance, specifically its color or opacity. The first good use of this effect is to create deceptive looking liquids, with blood and alcohol being two of my favorites. Making your water look like a strong liquor might help you win a drinking contest if nobody notices the lack of smell, and fake blood can come in handy in a number of role-playing situations. Another somewhat common use of this effect of shape water is to look through murky water. If you're looking down at very muddy water, you can alter its opacity to make it completely transparent. This might help when looking for treasure, threats, or fish while in shallow water. On the flip side, you can also make clear water completely opaque in order to hide something. For example, your gnome buddy with water breathing or something you plan to leave behind and collect later. My last use is to make prettier ice sculptures. I'll talk more about common stuff to freeze with the spell in a second, but if any of your designs require a bit of color, you can always alter the water's appearance before freezing it. This is especially useful if you want to make a fake gem out of colored ice. And last, but definitely not least, the final effect of shape water is to freeze water that doesn't have creatures in it. Sorry, no free restraint effects with a cantrip. Still, this is the final piece of the puzzle for making crude ice sculptures after lugging around water with the first bullet point and shaping it with the second bullet point. The first good use of freezing water is to create cover. Making ice walls can be a handy way of giving you and your allies a safer defensive space against strange attacks. Then there's the ability to block off passages by moving water into the space. Some people just leave a 5 foot cube of water and call it a day, but I feel like creatures can get through that pretty quick. Not so much with a 5 foot ice cube. In a similar shape making way, there's the ability to make ice bridges over short gaps, in conjunction with the move and shape water effects from above. Another fun use of this spell is to make stepping stones over a body of water. Making little 5 square foot ice patches for you and some allies to leapfrog your way over a small pond or river can be a handy thing when all else fails. If you're feeling destructive, you can use freeze water to make ice cannonballs to roll down upon unsuspecting enemies, or create big ice blocks for later use in deadfall traps. In a similarly destructive vein, you can use the spell to break machines. I know I said that shape water can't create anything mechanical, but it sure as heck can destroy something mechanical. With a combination of splashing a bunch of water on some moving parts before instantly freezing them, you might be able to disarm some mechanical traps without risking your health. And then there's the ever handy use to plug a hole in a sinking boat. Simple enough, and the fact that you're sinking means you definitely have water available to cast the spell. On a similar note, you can also make an ice raft. 
If you hope to cross relatively still water, this can be a more sensible option than the leapfrogging method I outlined earlier. On the flip side of this, you might freeze water to damage or slow a boat. If an enemy is trying to get away and you're not afraid of a little collateral damage, this can be a good option for stopping a small sized boat's movement. Another niche use is to melt water as a signal. After giving an ally a piece of ice frozen with a spell, you can dismiss the effect at any point over the next hour, causing the ice to melt. This could be used as a silent signal, and possibly make it look like your friend peed themselves at the same time. This next one might not come up often, but that's to freeze running water at a choke point. This could create a dam situation, which might cause a room to flood or create some other environmental hazard. These last few uses are a tad contentious, so take them all with a grain of salt and consider what your DM would actually allow. My first DM fiat required use of shape water is to create hazardous terrain. Now, the spell's description doesn't explicitly allow this, but the DMG does have rules for slippery ice that indicate a DC 10 acrobatics check to walk across without falling prone. As a DM, I definitely allow this, as a 5 foot square patch of difficult slash slippery terrain is less powerful than most cantrips, unless used in conjunction with some other creative tactics. In a similar vein, there's the use to create an ice spikes trap. If you shape the water into fine points and then freeze them at the bottom of a pit, that should work as a makeshift pit trap. Although I'd probably have it deal only 1d10 rather than 2d10 piercing damage as suggested by the DMG for a regular pit trap. Another contentious use of shape water is to freeze holy water into a weapon, in order to get bonus damage or additional effects against undead creatures or fiends. Rules is written, holy water deals 2d6 radiant damage to a fiend or undead. As a DM, I'd allow an improvised holy ice weapon to deal 1d4 physical damage, the type dependent on the shape of the weapon, and the 2d6 radiant damage. I'd also rule that a player has a chance of breaking that weapon each time they attacked with it, probably with a greater chance of breaking the more it's used. Another iffy use of shape water is to break locks. Now, you definitely need to see all of the water that you hope to freeze, which is one reason why people often say you can't use shape water in this way. The reasoning being that if the water is someplace where it would break a lock, it's also someplace that you can't see. On top of that, there's no guarantee that freezing a lock breaks it in a way that also unlocks it. And then there's also the balancing issue. Should a cantrip really have the potential to invalidate a character's proficiency with Thieves' Duels or the second level Nox spell? For these reasons, I don't allow this use of shape water at my table. However, I would allow for shape water to jam a lock with ice. This might slow down pursuers if you don't have a better way to lock the door. This could also be used on the door itself, or a window, or really anything else you need to freeze shut. My final shape water tip is to get a decanter of endless water. This magic item can make up to 30 gallons of water in a turn, all of which you can manipulate with shape water, as it easily fits in a 5 foot cube. It's kind of like the water skin that Katara always carried with her and seemed to carry in the supply of H2O for her water bending. It's only an uncommon item, and if you tell your DM your intention to use shape water a lot, you might just see it pop up in the early to mid tiers of your adventure. Phew! I don't think I'll ever top that many uses for a spell in D&D. And even still, I'm sure you can think of many more ideas with shape water. But for now, let's turn to the most common rules questions that come around this handy little cantrip. Rule number one is that shape water only works on liquid water. To me, this is made clear by the spell's fourth bullet point, which allows you to freeze water, while no other bullet point specifies turning ice to water or turning steam to water. Some DMs might roll differently, but it seems to me that the spell is using the idiomatic use of water as opposed to the scientific one. Incidentally, this also means that shape water doesn't work on other liquids like booze, paint, syrup, blood, etc. In my mind, if a liquid wouldn't be called water by a layperson, or the substance isn't at least 51% composed of H2O, shape water doesn't work on it. Rule number three is that shape water cannot be used to freeze and drop an ice block on an enemy in a single turn. I sometimes see players talking about bonking bad guys in the head with an ice block using shape water, but unless your foe is already unconscious, this takes a minimum of three turns to pull off one to animate the water over their head, one to freeze the water, and one to dismiss the first effects of the ice block falls. Number four is that shape water can't push stuff. The spell explicitly mentions that the movement of the water lacks enough force to deal damage. We, said we can also infer that it lacks any force, and so cannot be used to push things. However, a DM could easily rule that circumstances allow for shape water to effectively move objects around. And the last rule is that ice made with shape water ignores environmental conditions, meaning that it remains icy and cool for the full hour, even if it's left out in the hot sun. Again, DMs might rule differently, especially if fire magic is used against ice made with shape water. Shape water is a tricky spell to DM sometimes, but I hope these rule suggestions help for adjudicating such a highly versatile spell. Up next, let's answer the biggest question of all. Is shape water a good spell? My answer is a definite yes. Shape water has a crazy variety of uses, and being a waterbender is a fantasy we've all had since we met Katara. 
most importantly, it's a spell that rewards creative thinking and is fun to use, which to me are the key signs of a great D&D spell. That being said, Shape Water is a cantrip, so you should expect cantrip level utility out of it. Even if you don't try to do too much with it and live with its limitations, you'll still have 101 uses for the spell before your campaign is through. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this guide on Shape Water helpful and can show your appreciation with a like and subscribe. It's a massive help for small YouTubers like me. If you have any stories about using Shape Water in your own Dungeons & Dragons game or questions about the spell's rules, please share them in the comments below. This is D&D Lounge, wishing you the best of luck in your next spellcasting venture.